Great, thank you, Andrew. Modern technology. Well, hello. Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to see a few familiar names down there <laughs> of many years ago. So I look forward to catching up with you all um, at the end of the talk. Um, yeah, I mean, my just a quick, I had a really good uh, chat to Andrew a few days ago. I think we we're uh, trying the Zoom out. This is only my second time on Zoom, hence the hesitation slightly. Um, but we were chatting for an hour, I think, weren't we, Andrew? Yeah. And uh, put the world to right in command. But for those who don't know me, um, goodness, must be 15 years ago now or so, I was, I was the Wildlife Trust Officer in Carmarthenshire for three years, um, looking after the, I think it was 11 or 12 nature reserves then. Um, so obviously I did meet quite a, a few people when I was doing my three years in Carmarthenshire um, and get you know, some some nice nice sites as well. So I do know quite a lot of the the meadows and the grassland areas generally from the, you know, it's a massive county, isn't it, uh, Carms, and uh, all the way from the coastal grasslands right up to Clandovery and beyond. So it is a, it is a massive massive county with many grasslands. So anyway, um, I apologise beforehand if um, I don't know what knowledge everybody has, of course. So I have got some basic things in here, but hopefully you will get some, uh, some new things out of it as well. Okay, um, right, I shall make a start. Um, I just want to start with a little bit of background really. Um, what is a meadow? And I'm sure I don't have to, um, I don't have to tell your meadow group what a meadow is. I'm sure you all know what a meadow is. Um, but officially, this is what a meadow should, it, should be. So strictly speaking, meadows are fields vegetated by grass, which are cut for hay. And meadows are small permanent pastures, which have not been ploughed for at least seven years. That is the correct So definition of a meadow. So there we are. And why are meadows important? Um, again, I don't have to tell this group why they're important. <laughs> I'm sure we all realize they're fantastic for wildflowers, but also fantastic for insects with a little bit of reservation, which I'll come on right at the end, actually, of the talk. So just to give a little bit of uh, facts and figures to why meadows are important for invertebrates, really, insects and invertebrates. Um, and why they're important, 90% of UK meadows, um, which were present in the 1940s, have gone. We've lost them all. And I know Andrew has is, is, is done a lot of research on meadows and history of meadows, so you'll, you'll know all this. Um, which is quite appalling, isn't it, really? Um, and I'm afraid I blame these fellows. Mechanisation and the invention of the tract. Because what did we have before we invented tractors? Horses, of course. And what did horses need to eat grass meadows? So most farms, if not all farms, really, certainly right up in the hills of Mid Wales where I live, all the farms um, you know, had, had meadows, lots more wildflower rich grassland, which we've mostly lost. There's no demand, the horse of us, horses are nearly all gone. We still have one or two farmers up in the Elm Valley who still round sheep in on horses, on ponies, which is, which is great to see. Um, but I'm afraid it's the same right across Europe really, horses are almost no more. So again, a bit of facts and figures for you, why meadows are very important. Just one little example, um, those who love spiders, if you think that it, it's estimated that an average meadow, an acre of average meadow, contains over 2 million spiders, which is quite an amazing fact in itself. But if you imagine, and this is a very conservative number, 
if you imagine each spider of them two million, if it says it eats two insects a week, probably eat more than that, but it eats two insects a week for six months, one spider eats 104 million insects. And that's just one spider. So can you imagine the, the amount of individual invertebrate insects and spiders, everything in that med absolutely huge numbers of things. Um, 350 species um, are associated with dung of hoofed mammals in the UK. Yes, I know there's quite a lot of animals which are on the hills and various other habitats which are not strictly meadows, but it just gives you some indication that we still have quite a few just associated with the dung of grazing animals and some of which will, you know, horses, cattle, sheep, um, will be obviously using the dung uh, of, of grazed meadow mammals, which are grazing meadows as well, okay? And we also have over 1,500 insect pollinators, um, and Wales is leading the way in the UK with having our Welsh Pollinator Action Plan. And I do quite a lot of uh, surveys on pollinators and give lots of advice on pollinators. So it's certainly a, a big a big push for linking up areas of, of flower rich areas within Wales at the moment. And people like the Trunk Roads Agency in Wales are, are certainly one of the major sort of stakeholders in that because they're trying to link up a lot of roadside verges with wildflowers, which is which is good to see. But again, a lot of the councils, particularly the South Wales Council, South Wales Councils are creating, you know, um, wildflower rich verges rather than cut the verges, you know, like bowling greens, they're actually starting to plant and, and seed wildflowers. And even cornfield mixes I've seen as well, which is quite a sight in dry past. And then the big one, of course, is bees. Everybody's into bees now. Um, and of all groups of wildlife, bees have declined the most, 70% in just the last eight years. Why? The loss of wildflower grasslands, basically, in every form. So bees definitely not doing well. And if you don't forget that 80% of everything we eat is probably pollinated by bees. So you know, we have to help them. Otherwise we're probably doomed as well. So I just want to take you through um, some of the main groups of meadow invertebrates. Um, yeah, there's a bit of a discussion at the end. So I'll, I'll wait to the discussion. I'm, I'm thinking ahead at the moment. Anyway, um, lovely foxglove there, I know uh, in, in this slide and the bumblebee to the left. I don't even have to see that bumblebee very closely to know it's one of two species of bumblebee in Wales, because we only have three species in the UK which have long tongues, which commonly feed in long corolla flowers like foxgloves and honeysuckles. And this is a, a yellow banded white tail, and it is actually the garden bumblebee, because there's only two of the three that occur in Wales have long tongues. So this is the, the uh, garden bumblebee with its long tongue. Uh, and the other one is the, is the all sort of pale brown, pale ginger bumblebee, the, the common carder, which is a very common garden species as well. So there we are. Um, these things are highly adapted to cope with uh, um, specific um, flower sources in, in many cases. So let's have a look at some of the main groups. Um, a nice, familiar, easy one to start with, of course, are butterflies. Everybody loves butterflies, um, and they are great pollinators. Um, Percentage-wise, they only do about one, one or two percent of flowers, just because they're very low in numbers of species. We only have, what, a total of 70 in the UK, 30 or 40 species, sort of in Wales, probably, if you're lucky. Um, and there's a lot of butterflies are grassland species. In fact, most butterflies 
or grassland species, apart from one or two, like the hair streaks, which go for shrubs and trees, really. So most butterflies are grassland species. Um, so it's not surprising that a lot of our butterflies are in decline because they do need particularly long grass meadows. Um, a few there, the obvious one in the middle, uh, probably the most typical grassland, tall grassland species is the meadow brown there with the lovely eye spots. Um, and like just about all the browns feed off of grass, gr long grasses, um, particularly things like uh, um, uh, Yorkshire fog, uh, uh, Coxford, things like that. You know, actually some of the coarser grasses, particularly, um, very. But they're interested in shorter grass. They need a long grass, okay, which is interesting. Uh, and then the top left is the the small pearl bordered fritillary, um, which um, that actually feeds off violets. All the fritillaries except the marsh, the rare marsh fritillary all feed off violets, mostly dog violets. But in Wales, the, the small pearl bordered tends to transfer to marsh violets in Wales. So it tends to found in more, slightly more damper grassland near stream sides, that kind of thing. Um, and the caterpillar eats the, the marsh violets. Um, and then the bottom left in the jar is uh, uh, the rare and protected marsh fritillary, of course, and that is taken in Carmarthenshire. Um, I have a, a marsh fritillary license, actually, because it is a species you cannot legally handle without a license. Uh, and this was taken down at the Wildlife Trust Reserve in Carmarthen of Ross Kevin Bryn, which is a, a nice site. And again, it's, it's south of, of Crosshands. And as you know, in Carmarthenshire, that Crosshands area is a real hotspot for marsh fritillary and but I like actually conservation do own uh, and manager reserve themselves there um, at cross hands for marsh fritillary. So, um, but that's the only fritillary which doesn't feed off violets, it feeds off devil's bit scabious. So another, again, more of a, a wet grassland species. So I'm talking about grasslands, meadows really in the wider sense. Okay, so there's everything from damp marshy grassland through to the drier grasslands um, and then through to more rudral sort of um, grasslands as well which I'll come on to a bit later. And then we've got our um, common blue, the blue butterflies, the top right of course that's a female common blue. Females tend to be a little bit darker or well, a lot darker than the males actually um, and they had them lovely orange spots on the edges of the wing as well. Uh, and then again, these are species of, of birds for trefoil mostly. They go for sort of trefoils. Birds for trefoil um, is it's just a fantastic flower. My favourite and one of the best food sources for many, many butterflies and moths. Um, it's really important for them. Um, and the bottom right, of course, is the, the orange tip. Um, again, common on, on sort of slightly damper grasslands, mostly feeding on, on cuckoo flower. Um, and um, hedge garlic and things like that, things like that. So, so there we are, typical butterflies of, of grassland. And then coming on to some other butterfly, which are a real grassland species, um, are the skippers. And the skippers um, tend to occur in more loose colonies. Than the other species. So the small skipper on the left, the, the male's on the top with a female at the bottom of each picture there, and the large skipper to the right, again, both feed off various grasses, various grasses. Um, so they really need, need tall grassland. Um, the large skipper is a tiny bit larger than the small skipper, um, but you can see it has a little bit more of a, a dark a dark sort of wing towards the end of the wing. So it looks sort of slightly dark and light sort of orange where the small skimmer tends to be generally um, uniform orange right across the wing, just with a very faint dark sort of tip. Um, having said that, we've now got a third small type skipper, a, little, a third small orange skipper, the Essex skipper, of course which is relatively new. And it's a species which probably climate change, it's moved from the, the south and it's coming into Wales. It's now 
in Powys. So it must be in Carmarthenshire because we've seen it in Powys now where I live. And it's identical to the small skimmer. And it feeds off exactly the same grasses. And I'm just thinking, why, how do they not compete with each other? I really don't know. But you recognize them by, you have to catch one with a net occasionally. So every time I go and do a survey and see small skimmer, I have to catch two or three just to check it's not an Essex skimmer. And how you tell, if you look at that top picture of the small skimmer, and if you look at the, the antennae sticking above its head there, you'll see the underside is an orangey brown. It's orangey brown all the way to the tip of the antennae. If that was an Essex skimmer, it would have a dark tip on, just on the underside of the antennae. And that is how you identify them. Oh, crumbs. <laughs> so not easy, not easy. Um, but again, we can't just put down a small skipper anymore. We have to check for Essex skipper as well. So it begs the question, these things which are named after places Essex skipper, I'm afraid it's not an Essex skipper anymore because it's right through Southern England, right through certainly up to central Wales anyway. So worth, worth checking and worth looking out for. Um, and the bottom then is another one of our skippers. This is a, a dingy skipper. Um, this is a um, National Biodiversity Action Plan species. It's a lovely little skipper, um, brown with them um, sort of darker and, and uh, white marks along the edge of the wing you can see there. Now these things, not easy to find. They're getting quite scarce, very almost rare now in Wales. And what the like is, they're a grassland species, um, but what the like is, the tent, the like the bird's foot trefoil, which is um, in more rural areas. So a good places to look for them is more disturbed grassland, particularly like old quarry floors, um, where it's more what I call rural. It's been sort of, you know, cleared. It's been a, an urban site, perhaps it's been flattened, cleared and it's been sort of reclaimed by, by nature. And it's when them, them rural plants start seeding in there and it likes them very open, um, lots of bare ground because it loves to sun itself and get warm sitting on bare ground. So it needs bare ground as well as the bird's foot trefoil for the caterpillar. So it's worth looking out for on more sort of short rudral grassland with lots of bird's foot trefoil. And you certainly can find it, um, so worth worth looking out for, but very scarce these days. And then going into some of our moths, the the larger moths, there's quite a few day flying um, grassland moths, and all these ones here are all day flying, um, very attractive. the The top left is the one of our burnet moths, uh, and this is the six spot burnet. Um, um, there is also a five spot burnet which looks identical um, but it hasn't got the extra red spot on the tip and the five spot and the six spot are very widespread and there's others as well there's the narrow bordered one as well and very confusing but the five spot and the six spot are pretty wide the most widespread ones and the both feed off um, birds for trefoil again um, so how do they not compete? They're separated by habitat. The five spot burnet feeds off the greater bird's foot trefoil, a different species to the common bird's foot trefoil, and the greater bird's foot trefoil is more of a damp grassland species, where the common bird's foot trefoil, which the six spot feeds off, is a drier grassland species. Often you will see them both together, where a grassland has wet areas pass lower down on the field and the upper sort of um, slopes have um, a drier area. So you might even have both species together. And again, these are, these are colony, colony species as well. So where you'll get one, you'll get hundreds and hundreds of burnets. And then to the right, um, sometimes mistaken for a burnet is the cinnabar moth. Um, a lovely thing, of course, very widespread. Um, but now on the, Biodiversity, biodiversity action plan list 
because they've declined so much recently, they've been added to the list. Why is that? Because the feed off ragwort. And guess what? What have we been doing? Trying to pull and get rid of all the ragwort. <laughs> I remember my time um, in Carmarthenshire and even in my three years there, um, driving down the M4 occasionally, all the workers, the council workers would be pulling all the central verges, getting rid of, getting rid of all the ragwort because of course it is poisonous to, to horses in particular. Um, but it is a fantastic plant for pollinators and ragwort. Um, and if you can leave some, um, please do, because it is a brilliant, brilliant nectar source. And even if you, if you go to a field and you haven't, you know, you, you look at ragwort, you'll see, if you're lucky now, you'll see the, the striped blackened orange caterpillar, which is one just below there, feeding off the ragwort. And when you watch them, the, the caterpillars feed off the flower heads. So eventually they eat the whole flower head and the, the ragwort doesn't seed. So it's actually a self-control. And you think, well, we're pulling all the ragwort, getting rid of the cinnabar moths, and now they're so, in, you know, they're getting scarce now. Uh, and, you know, we, we've actually done that. We've actually got rid of most of the cinnabar moths now. So it's like, oh no. <laughs> um, and then the, the bottom right then, which is in the same family as the burnet, is that lovely metallic green forest moth. This is the forest moth. It's quite widespread, um, but it's getting very scarce now, very scarce. And this thing, it's another beautiful day flying moth, metallic green, lovely thing. It's like a small burnet, about, I don't know, half an inch long or more. And it's, it only feeds off sorrel. It will occasionally go for dock as well, I think, but mostly sorrel. And you think, well, a lot of these sort of declining species they all seem to feed off common plants. So why are they declining so much? Again, these things, very, very local forester moth now. Um, they're called forester moth. Um, nothing to do with forest at all. They're actually a meadow grassland species, um, only feeding off, off sorrel. Um, and I think the, the given the name forester because they resemble some of the, the early foresters' coats, I think, which were green. And then the, the bottom left is the very common migrant moth, the, the silver Y. So we do get a vast amount coming from the continent every summer. And you will flush these up if you walk through a meadow, you'll flush loads of these up um, coming in from the continent, just feeding on various flowers and taking nectar. Um, the silver Y, the silver Y moth, very common. Uh, and then of course, I think if you had to choose one typical a typical grassland moth. If you wanted a logo for your Carmarthenshire Meadows group, it would be that one in the middle, which is the chimney sweeper. What a beautiful looking moth. It's, you might think, oh, it's, it's all black and dull. Well, it's got this sort of, it's like a satin, a satin black, and it's got these lovely pure white on the wingtips. And again, day flyer, and this is getting quite scarce now, this thing only feeds as a caterpillar off pig nut. Now, it's a funny thing, pig nut, because um, you go into some meadows locally and you don't see any at all. And then you go down the road a few miles and it's all over the place. So it's one of them species where you have lo lots of or nothing at all pig nut. Um, again, it's getting very declined, this moth. and but it's one of the few true, true meadow species. It's able to survive in the meadow all year round. Whereas a lot of these other moths and other insects, which you might call meadow species, really are species which are coming in from surrounding habitats during the summer, taking advantage of the abundant nectar. Because when you think about it, a meadow is very, very temporary. You know, it perhaps gets grazed up until sort of end of April, May, um, late May even, certainly in the Elmvira, we're grazing until late May, because we're yeah. higher up, it's very late up here. And then 
within a couple of months, things have flowered, seeded, and then end of July, early August, it gets cut. So you've got about two months, really, if you're lucky, to, to you know, achieve your full life cycle within the meadow. Most species can't manage it because they're coming in and they're breeding in adjoining areas. Okay, the chimney sweet bar is one of the rare ones which can. It's got such a short life cycle, it's able to then, the eggs then, uh, it overwinters as, as an egg, presumably right on the turf or under the turf in the topsoil, uh, and is able then to survive all them winter months, and in about sort of April time, it emerges as a very tiny caterpillar, and then once the, the meadow starts getting longer, sort of May time, and then it starts to decline and feeding off the, the pig nut. And then it's able to then pupate, turn into a chrysalis, and then pupate, flies a moth, mate, lay eggs, and die within two months. So absolutely incredible. So the chimney sweeper, definitely the key um, meadow logo I would choose for a, a meadow group. So there you go. Right, and then, some of the some of the other moths and these are the micro moths my goodness well there's a vast amount of micro micro moths probably about 1500 in the uk and um, lots and lots and lots which do occur in meadows and grasslands of course as well and um, this probably is the the typical and more abundant of the, the micro moths these are the grass moths the day flying and you can recognize the majority of them the ones on the the two on the top there because they have quite long sticky out noses you can see very long noses and they tend to wrap the wings near or right around the bodies when the rest you can see the one on the top right one of the agrophilas it's sort of rolling its wings around its body like a cigar shape with a big long nose but there is um other species within the uh the grass moths um bottom left is the the larger, a larger one, which is a, a mother of pearl, and the bottom right is a small magpie. And you can mistake them for the larger macro moths because they actually are quite big. And people do get confused between a macro and a micro moth. Basically, it's nothing to do with size at all. Most my macros are larger, but there is larger micros as well, just to confuse us. And it's all to do with families. And moths, most moths are separated, all to do with wing venation and sometimes mouth part structures as well. So that's where they get lumped into separate families, I'm afraid. Very confusing. So again, most of these grass moths, they are literally the caterpillar is feeding off, off of grasses, a wide variety of grasses. Then moving on to um, some other things, we're coming into the the bees, ants and wasps order, a really massive order of insects, over 6,000 species in the UK. Um, and down the bottom then we have what is a typical wasp really. The bottom right, right, the Vespinae, um, the subfamily, this is the typical stinging wasp family. Um, and that includes our common wasp and red wasp and German wasp and Austrian wasp and all your different wasps. These are the stingers, okay? These are the naughty ones. Again, they are very good pollinators. Um, and these um, wasps, they're all predators. So they collect um, other insect prey, bring it back to the nest, build the nest out of paper. They've scraped with the, with the mouth parts um, and provision the cells with, with meat, basically. Um, so the Vespinae are, are stinging wasps or social wasps because they live together in a big nest. The bottom right, the bottom left is our Eumenonae. They used to call them a different family, Eumenidae, Day, um, but now they've been lumped in the larger Vespidae family. And there's only about 40 species of Vespidae and the Eumenids are the solitary wasps and specifically the potter wasps. And these are lovely little things. And these all um, collect mud and they make a little miniature pot, like a little clay pot, um, which is normally um, 
uh, made within sort of a structure, of, uh, a plant structure. There's a lovely one you get in the Elm Valley, which, uh, which occurs on, on heather. So you can find these little tiny centimetre wide pots on heather. And again, they do the same thing. They make a pot, so they're making their own cell and they're provisioning that pot with live prey and laying eggs on it. And the grubs then feed on the, 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 the prey. Um, so they're very distinctive, of course. Um, they've got the typical black and yellow stripes of a, a typical wasp. Um, and there's a lot of other different wasps. I'm not going to talk about the parasitic wasps or some of the other wasps. There's lots of them. But you recognise the, the Vespidae wasps because if you look at the wings, when they're resting, the wings fold. They've got folding wings. So if you look at that eumenid on the bottom left, you'll see when you see that left wing, you see it's quite straight along the bottom. That's because it's folded under the other wing. So when it flies, it automatically just unfolds that wing. Now, why they do that, presumably, it allows them a much more of a narrow passage within the, the cells or within the nests. So that's the only wasp family to actually have folded wings. The other ones don't fold them at all. And then the top are things called sawflies, which you've probably come across. And these um, have caterpillar type larvae and they are often mistaken for butterfly and moth caterpillars um, and the very very the all vegetarians the sawfly sawfly wasps I like to call them and they're the most primitive of all the wasps these evolved before any of the other bees and wasps so the floor sawflies there's about 400 species nice group to get a get grist with they can be very attractive. There's some uh, orange ones, there's bright lime green ones, um, ones with white spots, all sorts of colours. Uh, the one to the top left, the uh, mimicking um, the, the, uh, the typical yellow and black stripes of a stinging wasp. Of course, these sawflies do not sting at all. They're not able to sting, they're harmless. So they're mimicking the colours of bees and wasps to protect them from getting eaten by birds mostly, okay? And there's lots of other insects do that, beetles do that, which don't possess a sting. Moths do that as well. Um, a lot of other insect groups mimic stinging wasps. And it's only the bees and wasps order which can sting, no other insects can sting. So they're trying to get some protection from mimicking. So the top left is a, a figwort sawfly. A lot of them are quite specific feeding on, on, on individual um, types of, of plant or flower. And there's a different species. I don't know what it is actually on the top right. It's a very colourful one. But you can recognise the sawflies because they haven't got that typical pinched waist. If you look at the bottom two wasps, you can see where they have that narrowing between the, the, um, the thorax and the abdomen. Whereas the sawflies, the abdomens are in line with the thorax. They've got very straight sides, so you can recognize them like that. They've got very square heads as well, as if they've flown into a brick wall. And um, they're quite sluggish flyers. They don't fly very quickly. They're quite sluggish as well. So they've got certain sluggishy jizz, that, that bird watching term jizz, when you see them in, in the meadow. They're very sluggish when they fly. So. And then other members, of course, ants are just sort of um, specialised wasps, really, which nest nest in the ground and then excavate the ground and, uh, and then build mounds. So that's one of the red, the red ants. But a typical meadow um, one would be the yellow, the very tiny yellow hill ant or yellow meadow ant, which builds them lovely colonies of, of, of um, ant hills in, in meadows. And if you poke your finger in a top of a one of the little earth mounds of a, a yellow hill ant, within a few seconds then the ants will start coming up to where you, your finger had been and disturbed and start repairing the entrance. But ants, ants again, incredibly important because they have an awful lot of other insects which actually feed and live inside ant nests, including things like the blue butterflies and lots of others as well. 
to answer incredibly important things um, as well. Now coming into our, our bees, um, these are our most, by far, most important pollinators. Um, we've got 260 bees in the UK um, and only 26 so social ones. So 25 bumblebees and just the one honeybee. So there's a bit of debate whether the honeybee was brought in by the Romans a couple of centuries ago, but I'm not sure. Um, so the bumblebees, 25 species, and they're just fantastic pollinators. Really, nothing could compare with the pollen collected by a bumblebee. So bumblebee, overall bumblebees pollinate more of our flowers and crops than anything else. Okay, um, They're just specially adapted. They're amazing things. They're very hairy for a very good reason, because... They've done a recent study just been published in my latest one of my latest journals this year, actually. Um, they're looking at the amount of hairy hairiness on the face of bees. And they've discovered, not surprisingly, the ones which have the hairier faces, like bumblebees, pollinate more flowers. Because, of course, all bees have, most bees have a lot of hair. And when they're at the flower, they temporarily stick the pollen, which is very sticky some substance anyway, onto all the body hairs all over the place, particularly around the thorax and the head. And then they then sit and transfer, when they have a few seconds, they transfer that to other parts of the body. And bumblebees use the, the rear legs to carry the pollen. Some of the, some of the smaller um, species of solitary bee some of them carry in the crop, some of them carry under the abdomen on a lot of hairs there. But I'll, I'll mention one or two of them shortly. So we have 19 true bumblebees, what are called true bumblebees, which build nests and, you know, up to probably two, three, four hundred workers during the summer. And then they all die except the, the new queens, which then hibernate and then emerge to start a colony the following year. And then to the right, we have the cuckoo bumblebees, and we have six species of them. I'm not going to talk too much about bees because I know you've got um, uh, uh, a, bee, a bee talk coming up next, next month, I think. But the cuckoos really, uh, as the name suggests, do not build their own nests. So they do not have a worker cast. They just have males and queens. So um, they tend to emerge late in the summer because they want, they basically do what a cuckoo bird does. They find the nests of certain species of true bumblebee. And these cuckoos are very specific. They, the colors mimic the, the host bee colors as well. So you'll get um, black and an orange tip um, cuckoo, which is trying to mimic the red tailed bumblebee. And you'll get the, the yellow banded white tail cuckoos, which again are mimicking some of the white tail bumblebees. And they um, will go inside a true bumblebee nest and then take over the nest and, and lay eggs in the, the cells there. And then the, the slave workers will then feed and look after their young. So big cuckoos. Um, and then the honeybee, of course, down the bottom, um, again, a fantastic pollinator, um, but it's, it's, it's a generalist. So the bumblebees tend to be a little bit more specific. Generally, they're very good, but they will have specifics as well. And the honeybee is a real generalist. It's got a relatively short tongue. Um, so it's able to cope with many flowers, but not ones with very deep corollas. So they've all got their little niche in life. Then coming on to our um, solitary bees, I'm not going to mention them all because there's quite a lot of different, different ones. Some of the commonest, commonest ones are the andrinas, which are the mining bees at the top there. Uh, I guarantee you've got at least one or two species in your garden lawn even. And to the, to the right of the andrina, you can see a little, little um, 
patch of lawn with little tiny mini molehills uh, with holes in. And of course they dig down these andrinas into slightly drier soil. And they will occur in colonies, even though they're solitary. So they don't build a social nest together, but they will nest in individually in colonies quite often. Uh, they dig down and dig side burrows, and then again, they'll provision their, um, them burrows with, with pollen. So all bees are vegetarians, collect like pollen to feed their young on. So they lay eggs on the pollen, seal them up, and then the eggs hatch into little grubs of bees, eat the pollen, and then they emerge. Um, but it's not just all easy goings for these mining bees. Um, down the bottom right, there's one called a Sphecoides, which is a blood bee, and it's also a cuckoo, but a specialist cuckoo. And there's, there's a few a few of these actually, a few different species, and they're all quite specific. And this, some of these actually, they all predate different species of Andrina. So there's bees predating bees, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, and also we have other cuckoo bees, Believe it or not, the one, that nomada down the bottom left, a, a nomad bee or a cuckoo, another cuckoo bee, it's a bee. It looks like a wasp. It's actually a bee. So what's the difference between a bee and a wasp is wasps came first. Bees are just hairy wasps, basically. And the main taxonomic difference between a, a wasp and a bee, wasps have single hairs emerging around the body and bees have the hairs divided so they're much more hairy for good reason because they mostly collect pollen but these cuckoo bird bees tend to be much less hairy and almost bare as you can see in the bottom two pictures because they have no need to collect their own pollen um, and the nomada is mimicking a stinging wasp for protection as well with even further protection. So they'll go in um, various um, bee nests of diff different species actually. And there's quite a lot of species of them, 40, 40, 50 of them. And they're quite common again in grasslands. So worth looking out for, lovely sort of um, orangey brown and, and, uh, and yellow most of them. Right, okay, I'm getting on a bit. Okay, again, there's some other bees. You might have seen the leaf cutters, which uh, Again, solitary bees, which cut their own leaf and then carry it off to an aerial hole and then make a cigar shape and lay eggs in there. So these are all collecting pollen and uh, one called a sharp tailed bee, very, very scarce. But again, um, no records, very few records in Wales. They're starting to, to move north and west. Um, again, with global warming, climate change, things are pushing, pushing north and west. So again, worth looking out for. Uh, and then occasionally something really exciting turns up and um, this will please uh, 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 Susie from the Wildlife Trust who I think is uh, listening in. This is the, um, this is the, the longhorn bee which turned up um, at Gilvac, the Radnesha Wildlife Trust Reserve um, a few years ago. All very exciting and we had a lady called Barbara Bown who, who was working there at the time and uh, she saw this thing and actually jarred it, she jarred it up. Very exciting. And that's the photo, photograph on the, on, on the right there. This is the, a male. The females have got short antennae, which is a bit harder to spot. This thing is a bit of a conundrum because the, the bug life fact sheet, you can see, you can see that tiny map down the bottom there. Um, you can see it's just a scattering of records along the Southern England, perhaps one in East Anglia there, a little bit, a few along the South Wales coast, and then strangely, a bit of a band going up through Hereford, sort of Worcester to Shropshire there. And that's the records. So they're restricted really, it used to be more widespread. So really mostly just coastal in recent times. So what is it doing turning up in the middle of mid Wales <laughs> after all these years? Has it always been there? Probably not because it's a quite a well-washed well washed reserve that one and it's a very distinctive species probably a wandering male coming possibly from the the hereford sort of um the populations so we've got to show you these things do can travel a little way 
but it must be a bit of a risk really to from, travel long distances when they've got perfectly good habitat. These again feed commonly off um, clovers, trefoils um, and, and the ground nesters, the nesting in the ground. So beautiful, beautiful thing. And again, um, quite a large bee, sort of like a small bumblebee size. So there we are. So that's the very exciting. Uh, we all got very excited in Rodney Show when that turned up. Um, and then that's just a list of the, the, the bees aren't doing so well. You can see about 140 are still relatively local and common. 120 pretty scarce and rare now. And within the last sort of um, 30 years, 40 years, three or four become extinct. So not looking so great for bumblebees. But I'm going to whiz through these next ones because time's getting on. Um, again, other typical grassland species, of course, are the grasshoppers and the kin. Um, so the grasshoppers on the left, um, you know, the, they've all got, um, they're all feed off grass, but they're omnivorous, really. They will take small insects as well. Species which like drier grasslands, some wet grassland species. Um, but they've got very short, relatively short antennae, the grasshoppers. Um, whereas the bush crickets, now don't get confused with crickets, there's something different again, okay. Um, the bush crickets are just longer um, versions of the grasshopper, really. And you can see the one to the right is the antennae are incredibly long. So the bush crickets have got very long, narrow antennae and the, the grasshopper is very relatively short antennae, really, okay? So the bush crickets really are more species of, of more scrubby habitats. So you've got meadow edge with a bit of bramble, um, perhaps a hedgerow as well. They tend to be on that more scrubby areas, okay? So not really true meadow grassland species, the bush crickets, but you will find them on the edges. And again, this is a, a wet grassland species. Go, this is a, a real a good example of, of climate change. Right? Uh, because this was, um, sorry, the, the data came off the top. I think that was about 2005 or something, that top map. But you can see the, this is the Rose Ells bush cricket, which was restricted really to um, around the London area, Kent and, uh, and around there, really. Um, just west of London. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the bottom map, 2017, it's gone nuts. It's all the way up to Yorkshire, you know, Lancashire there. Um, I don't know where that came from, when Ireland. Um, and it's across into Wales. And since then, it's turned up at Denmark Farm and a few other places. I think that's on the Dovey Estuary, actually, that one there. Um, and all of a sudden, it, it's, it, it's waltzing through the country north all to do probably with that one or two degrees warmer. And it is a wet grassland species, um, um, but it's just going to show you how quickly these things can advance um, and colonize new areas. So it's worth looking out for in new um, damp grassland areas. And then coming on to another group, the another order, true bugs, which includes things like the shield bugs, very familiar. Um, these things on the left, these are related to shield bugs. This is the, the top one is the, is the dock bug. Again, feed off dock, very, very, very common. The size of a shield bug, quite big. And then the bottom left is something we don't really get in, in certainly in Radnish where I live. It's, it's too, it's too high up. Um, we're quite, I mean, Brecon and Radnish are, within Wales are average the highest counties altitudinally, so we're quite high. These things um, tend to be more lowland. And these are the tortoise bugs. Very distinctive, they look a bit like a tortoise. Um, and these tend to be more um, sort of drier, um, sorry, slightly sort of damper um, grassland species. Um, so you should have them in, in command, which are certainly around the coastal grasslands. Um, quite, quite large, good uh, size of a shield bug. Um, a good, good sort of half an inch. And the thing to the right, the, the drawing there, is one of the stilt bugs, which have big long legs, well named stilt bugs. And again, um, not common, but again, occur in sort of slightly more drier 
grassland areas. Um, so you should pick these up. Some of them can be reasonably bigger, an inch long, quite distinctive with them long legs. Now the, the bugs, the true bugs, um, they're, all, they're all suckers. The mouth parts are adapted like a needle for sticking and sucking, so they're not able to grind. So the majority of them are vegetarians. The shield bugs, some of them do go for blood, but they're mostly vegetarian sucking plant, plant juice with a, a long, it's called a long rostrum, like a syringe mouth part. So these are some other very abundant bugs, typical grassland species and plant species. These are the, the grass bugs or the Miridae family. 200 species of these, goodness gracious. And if you go into any meadow in the summer with a net or you just have a look at the flowers, you'll see loads of different species of these. The one on the top left there is the sort of yellowy, orangey black one, is one of the two meadow plant bugs, um, which are very, very common uh, in the meadows in the summer. And there's also, not illustrate, there's also two or three species of, of green ones, very elongate green ones, which turn brown in late summer to match the dying grass for camouflage. But there's also some lovely coloured ones. And the bottom right there is um, a lovely species called Calichorus rosio maculatus, rose spotted, um, which again is quite local and it's got them lovely rosy red spots. Um, which is one of the actually a flower feeder, but mostly sucking plant and grass tissue, really. Very common. And then another one which looks very similar. Um, if I just go back, you see these these grass bugs, the very elongate things. Um, whereas these things are damsel bugs, they look quite elongate, look similar to the the grass bugs, um, but these are damsel bugs. And they're all generally pale brown. But if you look at the picture at the top, the photograph, you can see from the side, it's rostrum, that's its, its stabbing needle mouth part, its syringe. Whereas all the other bugs, when they're resting that mouth part, it folds under the head and under the thorax. In some of them, like the shield bugs, they have a groove where that rostrum sits. And when they need to use it, they flick it out, muscular action, and then stab it into tissue and suck. But the damsel bugs can't fold that rostrum flat. So it's always curved and sticking out. So if you're not sure if you've got a damsel bug, have a look from the side. And if it's got this curly rostrum sticking out, you know it's a damsel bug. So these are, these are all blood suckers. So they're not vegetarians at all. So we've got a very common damsel bug, which is a, a dry grassland species. We've got a, a marsh damsel bug, which is a wet grassland species. There's a tree one, and it's a, there's about five or six different different species, all separated by different habitat requirements. And then again, very common and abundant. You've all seen these frog hoppers, um, cuckoo spit insects, lots of different species of them, hundreds and hundreds of them. That's the common frog hopper. And um, they are true bugs. They've got very short stabbing rostrum, um, but they look nothing like the other bugs at all. They hold the wings generally roof-wise um, when they're resting. Um, and this includes things like the leaf hoppers, a separate family, some of the other plant hoppers, but they're all vegetarians, all feeding on different plants. And you'll probably have 30 or 40 or 50 different species in every, every meadow, I would think. That's an, it's a, a bit of an obscure group to me, I must admit. I don't really do the leaf hoppers and frog hoppers. But in Radnishaw, we have an expert, Joe Botting, um, who, who actually is a, a, national, a national hopper recorder. So it's Joe the Hopper, he gets called. Um, so it's nice to have him locally. Um, and then, of course, a really big one, everyone's seen these hoverflies. And believe it or not, that large picture there at the top is a hoverfly. And this is one of our largest hoverflies, probably the best bumblebee mimic, and it's called Volucella bombylans, of course, because the bumblebees are all called bombus something or other. This is bombylans. And what a mimic. It is fantastic. All long hairs, 
in it. This is interesting, this uh, hoverfly. Now, if you're not sure if you've got a hoverfly or a bumblebee, because it's the size of a small bumblebee, this thing, two things, hoverflies always have very large eyes. Bees have large eyes, but hoverflies have even big eyes, huge eyes, and often meeting in the middle. And if they meet in the middle, it's probably a male. Male hoverflies, the eyes join at the top where females are separated, okay? And also the antennae on hoverflies are very short, just there, little stubs. If that was a bee, it'd have very long antennae, relatively long antennae, okay? Um, so incredible make. Now this thing's interesting because it's also the same color as a bumblebee because it actually goes into bumblebee nests lays eggs and the eggs tend to graze on the detritus that the bumblebees are brought in so it cleans up it occasionally feeds off the cells of bumblebee nests as well but generally they feed off all the detritus and the, all that spilt pollen and various things in in bumblebee nests and interestingly this volicella bombylans has three different color forms it has the the yellow sorry the the yellow striped white tail which matches the the white tail bumblebees it has an all black orange tip form which matches the red tail bumblebee and it also has an all pale brown form which matches the common color bumblebee as well so so each being quite specific on different bumblebees and again just some of the other bumblebees down the bottom um, do a fantastic uh, job at pollinating. Some of these smaller species, um, good for gardeners as well, because they have active larvae and um, they're feeding off aphids, on, particularly on plants. So if you can put flowers next to your cabbages, um, all the good, because the hoverflies will then lay eggs, um, feed off the pollen, lay eggs there, and then them um, larvae will then actively feed off aphids on your tomatoes or whatever. Okay. And of course, matching the mimicking bees and wasps because they can't sting at all. And again, some of the species, lots of different crane flies, which uh, easy to recognize with the long legs and long wings there, feeding, uh, feeding meadows as well. They tend to go for roots, that kind of thing. The leather jackets, of course, all the crows and the rooks dig them all up. All these bits of turf and find the leather jackets of, of these things underneath the larvae. You get other things, these huge big bumblebee size, pretty gross flies literally called Tachina grossa, the family called Tachinidae. These are big, pretty ugly. Um, and these are not very nice. They actually feed off various moth caterpillars. They actually lay eggs on caterpillars and eat them. But they can be, but 2017, they were everywhere. There seemed to be loads of them. Normally you see one or two in the odd field, these were just everywhere, 2007, 2017. So um, pretty distinctive with the orange tipped, the orange um, wing as well. Other flies, there's things called picture winged flies, which have got these lovely um, markings on the wing and you can recognize them, individual species, just on the wing markings. These are also called gall flies and the predate, particularly things like thistle heads and the female lays egg um, on the bottom of the thistle, it then lays a chemical around the egg. The egg in the hard head of the thistle then swells and um, the, the egg hatches into a little grub and it just feeds inside that apple at the bottom of the hard head, if you like, of the thistle. Different species all go for different uh, types of plant, but there's quite a few on thistles and knapweed as well. There's even wasps which predate them within, predate the grubs within the thistle heads, which is amazing. Another predator, um, another uh, sorry parasite, is um, you know these interesting small family of flies. Haven't got a common name. They're called actually Canopidae or Canop. Um, they're the sort of bee parasite flies, and you'll see them sitting taking nectar off flowers, and they've got distinctive sort of um, perect antennae. It's called sticking out antennae, very strong abdomens. And then when a bumblebee comes along, it jumps on them, split second forces its cuticle back of its abdomen, lays an egg, and the bumblebee flies off. And that egg then hatches inside the bumblebee and eats the bumblebee very slowly. 
So not a nice way to go. So bumblebees have all these things living in or predating them. So they've got an awful lot against them, the bumblebees, unfortunately. So they're very valuable things, bumblebees. Even more specific, we've even got a little group of flies which solely live in flower heads of globe flowers. Now, the map here, this was a distribution of this little genus of Chiastorchetta or globe flower flies. Who's looking for them, for goodness sake? So this came to my attention by a botanist locally, Ray Woods, a few years ago. So me and my colleague got together and said, there's a few sites in Powys where we live for, for um, globe flowers. We've got some in the Elm Valley where I live, and we asked the Wildlife Trust in Brecon if they could visit one of their sites. And we carefully visited four or five sites, and we carefully opened up the, the flowers of the globe flower and took a few flies that are impossible to identify because there's so many other little black flies as well. Took some back to the lab, and blow me, we actually found a couple of different species of Chiasto Cheta flies. So we've actually got some dots now for Ratnish and Brecon on the UK map. So they're probably on most glow flowers in the country. So interesting evolution because some people think that these globe flower flies have co-evolved with the globe flower itself. The globe flower um, gives up a small amount of seed to the fly because they lay eggs in the seed inside the flower head and the, the, the grub of the fly eats the seed. So presumably then the, the, that is offset by the, the flies then going to different flowers, laying eggs, but transferring pollen again between flowers. So interesting, interesting um, ecology on that one. And again, just finishing off with um, beetles, of course, as well. This is my, my strong group. I started with beetles. I'll probably spend more time identifying um, bees these days, but uh, I started with beetles and the beetle, the, the county recorder for beetles, as well as lots of other things. Um, this is a very typical meadow beetle. You must have this um, very distinct, bright metallic beetle, the thick legged flower beetle or nobly legged flower beetle. And look, its Latin name is called Audemira nobilis. What a great Latin name because the males only have got nobly back legs. There we are. And they'll use them for display to the female. They raise them in the air. Oh, look at me. I've got big knobbly legs. I've got bigger knobbly legs than that one. Yeah. Um, and then other, there's, there's a, another smaller species of, of these flower beetles, a little small sort of dull green one as well, and a brown one. Um, but ones you mightn't see too often, which are on the ground, are the ground beetles. And there's quite a lot of ground beetles which live in, in meadows as well. So the best way to, to, to look at them really is to put little jam jars or old yogurt pots sunk in the ground um, and then they'll fall in overnight because they tend to be nighttime hunters. Okay. So that's, there's lots of other different kinds of beetles. The soldier beetles are very active flyers, um, tend to be orangey, a few small black ones as well. They're called about 40 species or so in the UK. Um, they're called soldier beetles from one very common meadow species, um, which is red with a little black tip to the wing case, everywhere abundant during the summer in meadows. And they were called soldier beetles because it reminded people of Victorian soldiers' red tunics. But they've all, all, the, all the family got lumped with the name soldier beetle. But there's only the one which looks like a soldier, really. So again, these are omnivorous. They will feed off, uh, off, off nectar and pollen, but also take small insects. And the bottom one is a click beetle, very distinctive um, elongate beetles, very hard wing cases, very rounded at the front, at the head end and the tail end. And they've got these long thorns here which stick out on the back of the, the abdomen. And when you turn them upside down, they annoy them a little bit. They'll try to, they've got like this pin on the underside of the abdomen, which, which sits inside sort of a, an opposite groove on the underside of the, the, the abdomen. And, it, and, and the, they do like a little friction click and, and the jump like jumping beans. You can hear the click and it try, helps them to escape. So hence the name click beetles. These are all vegetarians. 
quite a few grassland ones as well as scrub and tree ones as well. And then leaf beetles, um, some of them are very attractive. Um, this is similar to the, this is one which feeds off hemp nettle in slightly damper grasslands. There's a very common one is the lovely green metallic um, dock leaf beetle, of course, which feeds off docks and sorrels and it'll strip the whole dock leaf and leave a skeleton of leaf behind. Very similar in, in coloration to, to that one. And then the one on the left is a lovely thing called a tortoise beetle. And they're very flattened and they do look like a tortoise. And when, they, when you annoy them, they'll pull in the head and the antennae and all the legs and they'll just sit and grab the leaf and all greeny things and you just will not see them sitting on a leaf. They're highly camouflaged. So that's the tortoise beetles. A few species of them. And they again, particularly on thistles, and you get one or two species of them. All vegetarians, by the way. And this is my favourite group of, of beetles. These are the longhorn beetles. Reasonably large, most of them, quite attractive, some of them up to an inch long or so. Um, um, on the right here, uh, this is the, the, um, the four spotted um, longhorn beetle. Again, this was reasonably scarce. Now, what's interesting about these two beetles and this lovely red cardinal beetle here, they're not meadow species. They're actually woodland species because all the longhorn beetles, they all feed as grubs in, in some kind of wood, in dead wood mostly. Different, different species of tree. And the cardinal beetles are the same. They feed, the larvae feed on, on trees. So, but of course, when the adults emerge, they want to feed. They want, you know, some protein. So they then go to these nearby adjoining flowerage areas, meadows particularly, very valuable near woodlands, all fly in there. So you'll get all these other insects coming from the adjoining habitats taking advantage of the, the nectar, but also very importantly for a lot of these other non-meadow beetles, if you want to call them that, it's the only way they find each other to meet and mate, particularly white flowers. They like the homing on white flowers and often that's the only way the male will meet the female to mate. So very, very valuable to have um, flowers um, areas next to woodland. So it isn't just strictly the meadow species which benefit, it's all these other adjoining habitat insects which come in as well. Okay. And then very lastly, um, just spiders again, lots and lots of different spiders in, in, in meadows. Um, there's a lot of the, the web spinning spiders, like the metas which build lots of webs. This is a very typical larger one, one of our sort of wolf spiders, the nursery web spider, very large, very distinctive female can be two inches long. And of course they build this huge domed web, six inches across in tall grassland. And then um, the, the female beforehand carries the, the, the ball of eggs, all loads of eggs inside there, all woven together with silk um, around. And just before the hatch, then she'll build this dome nest, take them back to the nest, and she'll hatch the little spiderlings within the nest for safety for a short while until they're able to wander off and feed for themselves. So very distinctively, but it only occurs in tall grassland meadows. So it's a nice local um, species, nursery web spider. If you've got long grass in nice meadow, you, you should have that. And then harvestmen, um, again, not spiders at all. They've got eight legs, um, but they've only got what looks like one body part rather than two of a spider. Um, they're, they're a bit more closely related to crabs than spiders, really. Um, but they've got several body parts, but in more of a, a rotund sort of a shape. But they've only, they've only got two eyes, unlike a spider. And most spiders have eight eyes. So these are going to have two eyes on a little turret on the top of the head. So again, there's quite a lot of grass and species of these, all predators. Um, long legs so they can cope with crawling through the long grass. Um, not particularly um, scarce, most of them are pretty widespread. There we go, and I'm going to finish there. I think my time is, is up, probably had an hour. There you go. So, um, 
again, I just like to um, finish my talk and say thank you for, for listening. And I'd like to throw it open now to the discussion and questions and perhaps talk a bit about medal management. And hopefully the talk has thrown one or two questions up uh, as well for you to ask. So I shall end it there and over to Andrew. Thank you. Okay, Phil, thank you very much indeed. Um, has anyone, if, if anyone's got any questions, um, perhaps you could um, put them uh, on the chat box. Um, and Phil, you can stop screen sharing if, if you want. Uh, I think you should find the button yes. up at the bottom yeah. left somewhere. And... Uh, um. Yeah, is that the yeah uh, stop stop video or stop screen stop, stop yeah, screen stop, share yeah. that's it oh, yeah, there we are we good there we, we go my second time so i'm a little <laughs> <laughs> okay um question from chloe can you recommend a good field guide for saw flies ah it's funny you should mention that. <laughs> um, this Christmas, I bought my friend and fellow entomologist colleague who lives in Raider, three miles down the road from me, a new sawfly book. It was £74, pound, though. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sawflies of Europe. I'm afraid not, no. Um, what we do have is there is... There's no modern UK guides to identify all the sawflies as species. The Field Studies Council do publish a little, lovely little guide. Um, in fact, all the Field Studies insect guides are worth having. They're only like six or seven or eight quid each. They're really good. And they do one on sawflies, but they do them to genus, which is very useful. And if you can get them to genus, you've, 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 you're nearly there. It's only down to a few species normally. Um, is that one so of the fold-out laminated guides? No, no, it's one of the. Um, I've probably got it here somewhere if I can dig it out. So that I'm in my in my study with all my insects. So probably uh, in front of you. I think I've got it here somewhere. Yeah, there you go. It's got a nice, a nice front cover. You can see that. Oh yes, nice front. Cover. Um, there we are. The sawfly there. No, it's a little a little booklet. Um, and a quite inexpensive booklet. Um, there's lots of them. If you go on the Field Studies Council website, actually, I think they've just changed the name, haven't they? Anyway, the Field Study Council website um, and look at their book publications. They've got a list of all the, all the, all the books, but the Sawfly um, one is very good. So I'm afraid we couldn't really do Sawflies very well until recently. But you, um, so this European book I bought, it's very expensive and includes all of Europe as well as Britain, but a very good source recently, which I'm just starting to use last year, is there's actually a Sawfly website. Yeah, finally. So if you go on, if you just type in Sawflies, I think it's sawflies.org. Sawflies.org is a lovely website on Sawflies. It's got a, a checklist of all the British species. And if you click on, one, it'll come up with a whole page of a distribution map, ecology, um, what the feed off and some identification tips and, 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 and often quite a lot of photographs of um, the adults and some of the larvae as well. So that's a really good source, um, but it's not an identification guide. You've got to sort of sift on through it and then narrow it down, but you'll become familiar with some of the, some of the genuses, some of the small ones, some of the larger yellow stripey things and some of the green ones but um yeah so there is things there which help you but at the moment there's no modern keys to every single uk species uh, another thing um we were talking about bumblebees they they overwinter as mated queens hibernating um how for example you, you think of walking through a meadow in the summer and huge numbers of grasshoppers are getting out of your way what how do they <laughs> overwinter at what stage of the life cycle do they overwinter yeah well mo most most things i mean 
you know, yes, we all know that there's a few butterflies and moths and a few other things do hibernate as adults, you know, herald moths and red apples, that kind of yeah. thing. Um, or try to anyway. Um, um, but most insects overwinter either as an egg or a larvae. So they shut themselves down. Often they'll, some of the chrysalis as well, some of them they'll pupate in the soil. Um, so they overwinter that way. They basically shut themselves down and then they'll emerge the following spring when things warm up, um, either hatch out the egg or some of them like, a good example would be the, um, the marsh fritillary, the, the rare marsh fritillary, that then the adults obviously mate in the summer when they meet. The female lays eggs on the scabious leaves. Um, and as we know, they lay a gregarious collection of eggs and then the caterpillars then will feed gregariously on a set of leaves and they'll produce this browny silk across them to protect them to a certain extent. That's how you find them by looking for the little sort of like a, a brown spider's web almost mm -hmm. over the caterpillars. <clears throat> And then um, they'll then feed as a very small caterpillar that late summer, early autumn. And as soon as it gets cold, we'll then just probably go to ground as in literally under the turf over winter as a small caterpillar. And then emerge the following spring to feed a bit more yes. before pupating into a chrysalis and then hatching into a caterpillar. So mostly eggs or, or larvae, but it does vary. Okay, you you have to wonder. Um, going back to bumblebees, I keep doing that because I used to work on bumblebees. But yeah. if you're a queen bumblebee, you find somewhere to hibernate in the autumn. You've no idea what's going to happen in the winter, and if you think of what the late autumn and the winter has been like so far, how many of them? just drown because the ground's so waterlogged well i mean i wonder what the, the mortality rate is of that stage of their life cycle well bumblebees um i'm sure sort of liam next month we'll talk a lot more about bees but um basically if you think i think a lot of people think of bumblebee nests as a bit like a wasp nest you know a wasp nest can have thousands of workers in there bumblebees yeah uh -uh, no Small. way to have between one to 300 probably maximum depending on the species some of them only 50 or 60 workers during the whole of the summer during the whole of the season now um, and right at the end of the season the host queen the original queen then stops laying worker eggs which are females of course and it lays males and then um and then queen eggs so the males then um leave the nest when they're ready they set up um, territories, the males, and then defend them territories to, to typically on a hedgerow, that kind of thing, and then they wait for the new queens to emerge. So a typical bumblebee, you're looking probably at between no more than 20, 30, 40 new queens from one nest. So if to maintain the population, you know, if there's 40 new queens emerge, 39 of them die, and one of them survives to maintain the population level. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think... That's all you need. Yeah, if you want an easy life, you shouldn't be a bumblebee. Uh, I know when, <laughs> no. when we were working on uh, one project, we were monitoring several, quite a lot of nests that we knew about on Rothamsted Farm, and only the ones that were under tree roots or something were not dug up and eaten by badgers <laughs> all the ones that were easy think, to get you know, at were just eaten i would i would yeah i would just default if you want to know more about bumblebees and i'm sure many of you have read dave dave colson's first yep. book he's written on bumblebees you know it's sting in the tail sting in the is, tail is brilliant yep. And then the second one's a buzz in the meadow about these French yeah. farm, which is really interesting as well. So read that book. There's a lot of research in there, and it's if you you'll know you'll be a lot wiser about bumblebees if you read a sting in the tail. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, question from David. Thanks for brilliant talk. Any general thoughts on meadow management? I guess especially how it impacts yes. invertebrates. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a there's a few things. I mean, I think the main thing is. 
I mean, meadows, particularly hay meadows, they're very traditional. You, you manage them for generally for the wildflowers. Some of them have some scarce plants in. Certainly the ones in the Elm Valley are pretty unique. Um, they're separate triple SIs within a larger sort of protected area. Um, so it's interesting because, um, you know, they're typically grazed by sheep, you know, right from, you know, autumn right through the winter and you go there and it's absolutely nothing. It's, it's almost rude raw grassland by the time it finishes, not to bear ground, everything. Sheep are taken out then end of April and then all of a sudden, amazing. Butterfly orchids. We have a lot of um, wood bit of vetch or upright vetch, some people call it, which is because it's not a wood thing at all. Wood bit of wood bit of vetch, which is amazing. Sawwort, meadow thistles, things like that. Really, some really scarce sort of typical meadow meadow plants as well. Um, and I think I think that traditionally graze and then flowered for hay, and then and then cut and then obviously grazed over the autumn winter. Now that's all very well, but these days I've heard farmers just do it, just neighboring farmers, if you're lucky to have a, a private nature reserve like some of your group members have, and um, you've got a meadow and all that, some of your farmers will, neighboring farmers will, will cut that hay for you. But he's saying, well, some of them say, well, there's, there's not much, there's not much in that, is there? There's not, there's not much substance in there. So I could, but I can't use it, you know? <laughs> um, Look, hopefully most hay meadows will get used for, for hay during, during the winter. Um, but I think, I, think, I think what you should think about is, is, is perhaps not be so stringent because these meadows over centuries, probably literally, have had to cope with lots of different conditions. Some of them have probably been overgrazed, probably undergrazed, um, different grazing types of animal. And I think, for me, it doesn't matter if you don't cut a hay meadow every year. Why do you need to cut it every year? Unless you want the hay, obviously you'll cut it every year. That's great. You want to keep the fertility low. You don't want all the things to build up and the pH to go up, whatever. You want to keep it low. But a year isn't going to make a difference. So, and even in the Yellow Valley now, they used to stringently cut the hay meadows every year. But now they don't. They miss a year or two. They just slowly graze it off rather than cut it and then do it that way some years it's not it's not cut at all it's interesting and it maintains it actually increases the 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 orchids are increasing the you know the wood bit of etch is increasing all the time the wood bit of etch covers half the field it's incredibly abundant it's an amazing thing and the bees are going absolutely berserk of course it's amazing but i think the thing is is that when you think strictly of meadows or tall grassland Meadows, they are very temporary on them. I mentioned before, they're very temporary. And if you think about it, if you're a meadow insect, oh, feeding all these lovely flowers, I'm a little bee zipping around, oh, I'm going to lay some eggs in here because it's nice. And all of a sudden, the next day, bang, it's all cut. There's no flowers, it's all gone. What do you do? That's it. You, you've got no eggs, nothing, it's all gone. So, you see, there's not many things can cope with that. A few things can, like the chimney sweeter moth. So I would question, unless you need the hay, why do you need to cut it every year? And even if you need the hay, can you not just cut half of the meadow one year and then cut the other half the following year? Because the main impact to insects is devastation when it's cut. Mm. Because all of a sudden, that temporary flowers have gone. And that would support many bees into the autumn, all that late pollen, some of the late pollen. And so I would, and of course, a lot of grassland insects, the breeding in the tall grassland, they need the crawl grassland to breed in, to lay eggs, to have chrysalises in. So if you cut it short, you've lost all them breeding insects. So if you can leave long grass one year, or even a small percentage of on grass, even a 10% on the edges, you're going to maintain your more grassland species. Yeah. If you would do it, you just cut it totally in one lot. So that, that to me, that would be, if you're, if you're a conservationist, I think I'd recommend trying to 
alternate between years. Just cut half and cut, or even two thirds, whatever you want to do, or even three quarters, but try to leave some taller grassland because all your breeding, your burnet moths, all your everything would be cut and gone otherwise. It, it, if you've got long, some long grass over the autumn, over the winter, you're maintaining a breeding populations of insects. I guess it also depends exactly. on on what else is around. If I mean, yes. for example, at our place, we've got um, next to the meadow, there's another field that we've actually planted with trees, but it's also covered in grass. So there's always long grass there. And uh, mm. the, the a neighboring field is they don't do anything with it. So it's sort of long grass gradually turning to scrub but there's always a refuge there and i guess the other thing is to cut it as late as you dare without yeah. i mean we usually we do this every year we cut it as late as we dare cut it and in fact <laughs> this year we it, it got into um august and we thought yeah that's fine we didn't cut it till the end of august last year and we we there was a nice week and I did something else rather than cut the field. But uh, then the storms arrived and it rained continuously for about the next yeah. month. So I was very relieved to hear you say, well, it actually, it doesn't matter if you don't cut it every year. So what we actually did was get sheep in to just eat it off over, over, uh, you know, a couple of weeks. Yeah. So, I mean, the main, the main thing really is to, I mean, you don't want bramble or young scrub no. coming in, which isn't going to come in instantly within a year, I no. suppose, really. Um, but you know, you do need to get the you do need to get that off sometimes. Even if you're great cut it, you still need to remove that yes, material. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Otherwise, that builds up and it it changes then yes. from what you don't need yeah. really. So yeah, yeah, everyone knows about there's lots of lots of you know hay meadow management things up there on, on the line and on, on the web and stuff now so um everyone knows about meadows how to manage them these days so it's really good one thing i would say another couple of things i would say is um to me a meadow is you, you've got the, the grassland meadow which is great but to me a meadow an, an, an integral part of the meadow really are also adjoining hedgerows or any scrub things like that yeah because they act very much as wind barriers which are a lot and shelter that a lot of species need, yeah. Um, but also, it if some of them hedgerow species like hawthorn are left to flower, that offers another source of of, of nectar and pollen mm. for you know them them local insects because they're all living locally somewhere. Even or if a woodland species coming into your meadow temporarily, they're still living locally somewhere. So you know, very much I think a meadow to me. It's uh, hedgerows, uh, really an integral part, part of, of it, of absolutely. And I guess a hedge is right actually a sort of artificial woodland edge. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yes, yeah. I mean, there's very, you know, I mean, it's where do you draw the line? I mean, the meadow, you know, it's, I mean, some of the the meadows you go, certainly in the, the uplands, I've done some upland, upland. Uh, Pollinator service this year up in some forestry areas where there's been felled and it's just full of tormentil and heather and bilberry, very, very heathy. It's more of a heathland, but there's still sort of sort of meadow areas within that. And a lot of them are rudral areas, again, colonizing with birds for trefoil, other things as yeah. well, be sort of in amongst the heather. And it's like a mix, it's like a mosaic of sort of rudral birds for trefoil type grassland and 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 heath and i suppose slowly after a few years the the heathland dominates at the expense of the of the birds for trefoil you know and, mm. and tormentil um mm. which is which is which is interesting but i think yeah it's so there is different kinds of grassland and obviously you've got the more sandy grassland certainly down in south command on the coastal yeah. belt there which is fantastic for bees and i think another thing i would um also say about managing meadows don't be scared if you've got if you've got a tractor with big wheels or a digger. Don't be scared to drive it through the middle, <laughs> because or if you do if you do some of the cutting by a strimmer, 
put a blade on it rather than a, a you know a, a, a cord because even if you accidentally but in my case on purpose if i was doing it even if you cutting the meadow and you miss you went a bit low and you chopped into the ground and exposed some soil that's good yeah because that creates rudral little rudral little bits all over your meadow which of course things like the bees need to nest in they need the bare ground so a lot without bare ground they can't nest they can't nest they've got nowhere to nest so if you want to maintain your bees particularly the solitary bees and solitary wasps they need some kind of bare ground some of the will you know some of the woodland ones will be aerial nested in tree holes that kind of thing but most of the grassland ones will need some kind of bare areas as well so don't be scared to 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 actually maintain or create maintain areas of bare ground just a corner a sunny corner in the sun it's got to be in the sun the, the bees like the sun so so if you've got a sunny a sunny side of your field even just a little strip five meters wide 20 meters long if you can just maintain that as bare soil or a few patches of bare soil brilliant easy to do and so beneficial to the mining bees and wasps there's a comment from we'll have to wind up shortly we're supposed to have finished five minutes ago but there's a comment from moira <laughs> <As ever. laughs> it's good to cut it late one year in three or four in, in order to allow seeding periods to drop you have to be careful with sheep because they can destroy some flora and different flora seed at different times that's definitely true i know the last things um in our fields to to drop seed sure. is knapweed <laughs> the knapweed is brilliant plant for bees uh but yes. it's not going to ruin it if we if it doesn't seed one year because it's all there it's it's a perennial it'll come back anyway without seeding so yeah but yeah. that weed's great yeah i think i think the danger yeah no I, I quite agree with that i think the other danger as well of, of leaving it three or four years before it's cut is is bramble yeah because if bramble gets hold you've got to get your spade out and dig every single root out and I know, I know a lady in Carmarthenshire when I was there, I gave her some, I, I visited, I can't remember where it was. It was slightly up the hills in, in northern Carmarthenshire, had some lovely meadows, and, uh, and she was hand digging all her bramble out. I wish I could remember the lady's name. Um, she might even be a member of your group, and if, if you are, <laughs> good. <Yes. laughs> she, had, she was hand, she, bramble, there's an awful lot of bramble in this field. The meadow was superb. Um, yeah. And she was hand digging all this bramble which is a task it was amazing but yeah that's the only way to do it so yeah Mo moira's just yeah moira just added i didn't mean don't cut the other years i mean cut do it a late cut in one of those years or late cut. Yeah, yeah i yeah, see what yeah. you mean no, that's what doing. yeah what we do with ours we just mow round the edge all several times a year while it, the meadow is all flowering just to stop the bramble encroaching and also blackthorn suckers as well you get blackthorn coming up yes. away from the hedge yeah oh well you, you've got to be careful in command because you've got brown hair streaks on blackthorn yes so. and richard yes. smith i see your name up there you know all about He's that there. <laughs> yes he was telling us all about that last week we've all been looking at our blackthorn trying to find <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah eggs and uh, a comment from lucia from plant life sometimes when you cut early in may or june but only a small part of the meadow some of the flowers will reflower again so you will extend the flowering season which is a good very good point yeah yeah quite true yeah, yeah. oh and I ivy ivy from our group says i know the bramble digging lady <laughs> <laughs> excellent Fantastic. i must get my map out of commandshire and find the name of the farm i'm sure i'll recognize it but um yeah it was lovely <laughs> lovely meadow yeah <laughs> okay well i think we better pack up it, it, it's 10 past nine now we were supposed to finish at nine but never mind it's been very thank interesting you. thank you for all your questions and comments and thank you phil very much we, we've never had a Geordie speaker before, and it was great. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.
You're welcome, Andrew. Thank you, guys. It's nice to see some names I recognise. It's a shame I can't <laughs> see many of you. So uh, anyway, I hope to bump into you in the near future. Yeah. Okay. Thank <laughs> you very all, much. All <laughs> Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Okay. Good night, all.